Happy Think Tank Thursday. Uh, looking forward to a great discussion. My name is Dan Weisskopf, and I am lead ETF strategist for the ETF Think Tank. Am I coming in, guys, choppy, or is it clear? Coming yeah. a little choppy for me. Good enough. Good enough. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, happy Thursday, everybody. Dan Weisskopf here, the ETF professor, um, also co PM with Mike. Venuto uh, on the blockchain um, ETF and lead ETF strategist for the ETF Think Tank. Thrilled to have everybody here. And of course, our special guest is Michael Green. Um, thrilled to have him. Um, with that, I'm, I'm going to hand over the mic to Cynthia Murphy um, for, for her role. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Cynthia Murphy, head of research for the ETF Think Tank. We have a great show today. But uh, we'll continue the intros first. David, you're up next. Thanks so much, Cynthia. David Chikansky here, fellow portfolio manager within the Title Financial Group on a few of our ETFs and SMAs. And I'll pass it over to our co-founder and CIO, Mike Nudo. So I guess I don't have to say that I'm the co-founder and CIO anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to go with just, just Chief Cat Herder. That's my favorite title here. Uh, excited to be on today. Uh, on logistics, I moderate the chat for you folks. I just put the uh, Twitter feed out there. We're expecting a lot of people to join. So please repost it for us. Our uh, celebration word today is going to be real. As in real estate or real assets or the real price. We'll figure it all out as things go. Um, real excited to introduce Mike Green at Simplify. You know, we are the ETF think tank and the work that Simplify is doing in the ETF world has been revolutionary. They've done an amazing job bringing unique products to market um, and educating. And that's one of the most important things to us here at the ETF Think Tank. So with that, Mike, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, Mike Green, Chief Strategist, Portfolio Manager with Simplify Asset Management. Uh, as you mentioned, we're an ETF shop that launched in September of 2022, taking advantage of some of the changes and regulations that allowed the inclusion of hedge fund-like strategies within ETFs. Uh, our specialty is kind of in the alternative space, and we've been incredibly fortunate to, you know, benefit from growing interest in that space, particularly from the RIA community, but also individual investors who reached out and said, you know, we're looking for something slightly different in our portfolio. So this has been a fantastic opportunity, and uh, the team at Simplify has made my life very, very easy by focusing, taking over the execution side running the back office, which anyone who's involved with ETFs knows that the operational side, the complexity of that is 10x the anything else. So I consider myself to have the easy job. So I love this part. I'm going to jump in first because, um, you know, that's what we do is for other entrepreneurs. We, we do that back office stuff. And I, I find that a lot of people focus on this whole 6011 was the ETF rule. It was coming forever and how it was gonna change the world. And it, it did make things easier, but I think what's made it available to do a lot of the things you folks do, as well as a lot of things we do with like the yield max suite or our long short funds or the same kinds of things was this derivatives rule. The idea that now, if you could follow this VAR rule, you can do derivatives in an ETF structure. And that that was a bigger change to me than the ETF rule. 100%. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe you could highlight some of the, kinds of strategies that couldn't be done as an ETF three years ago or four years ago that you find really interesting today, the, the, those kinds of concepts? Well, some of them are super complex and some of them are incredibly easy, right? Um, on the complex side, if I'm pointing to some of our individual portfolio or some of our individual funds, you know, we have true managed futures funds now that are running with inside ETFs. So they're not replication strategies. They're not not trading on a weekly basis, following other behavior. They're actually generating their own internal signals and trading on a daily basis, rebalancing the trends, doing so in a very active way. We just launched a credit fund, um, which uh, I'm going to try not to talk about tickers. I guess I shouldn't discuss them. Um, Brian, not up and down if I can, but uh, I see my, my uh, chief of marketing there. He's shaking his head no. So spell the word credit and take out the E and the I. Um, 
And, uh, you know, that fund is an actively managed credit fund. It actually will have uh, CDS within it, et cetera. We're going to offer the same thing within other products. So like all sorts of things that, believe it or not, are incredibly difficult to do within a mutual fund context um, or an ETF context can now actually be done. Um, that opens up the universe. I, I hate the phrase, you know, democratizing the world of investing, but it really does actually make available many of the strategies that have historically only been available to high net worth or institutional investors are now available within liquid ETFs with transparency, et cetera. Um, and more importantly, and this is, you know, one of the reasons why I switched over from the hedge fund side is when you can do this within an ETF, you can actually be far more tax efficient than you can within a hedge fund. And one of the reasons why people are, are why hedge funds focus in the institutional space is because a lot of the strategies that are done just are not at all tax efficient, right? Options, for example, terribly tax inefficient for the average retail investor can be managed within an ETF far more efficiently. There's all sorts of things like that that have, that have uh, you know, played through, but it's been an amazing experience at the same time. And you guys have probably had the very same experience. I mean, I like to highlight to our investors, meaning literally both our clients and actually our sponsors, we've worked for give or take three years now to grow by basically one and a half days of Vanguard's inflows, right? So this industry is, you know, Success is, quote unquote, defined as the difference between the absolute giants of the industries and the rest of us who basically resemble pimples on elephants' asses, right? Um, it's just not, you know, a fair fight in the way the industry is set up. And hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that. Hmm. So, Mike, well, maybe speak for yourself about what would you say, a horse's ass or something? So Oh anyway. no! I definitely am a horse's ass. Yeah, that's, <laughs> my, my my wife is downstairs. She'll validate that for you. So, when you think about um, your products, who is without talking about specific products, who is the target market? Right? Is, is it is it um, fund managers? Is it sophisticated financial advisors? Is it family offices? And please don't say all of the above. Yeah. Well, so so the quick answer is. Um, our products are actually, pro there are some of our products that are suited for all of the above. For example, we offer a levered two-year treasury future in an ETF wrapper, all right? Um, we, we may own a substantial amount of that, just so you know. <laughs> that may be a great idea. Looking at the rest of this year, it's been a disaster on a year-to-day -day basis. Um. But that, that would be a product, for example, that would be suitable and actually desirable for anyone who does not have access to an, a, a you know, securities relationship called an ISDA, where it would allow them to trade directly with the street. Um, obtaining that leverage, I'll actually give you a real story. One of the funds I manage right now has just, just taken what's actually kind of a moderate position in two-year or in um, uh, uh, SOFR futures. And it immediately, it was funny, I didn't even think about this, it immediately pops up that I've got now two times my notional in a single security, which makes everything else in my portfolio look tiny, but on a risk adjusted basis, that's a not like it's almost a non exposure, right? So something like that can actually be super valuable for a high net worth or a family office that wants to have easy reporting to a principal and say, you know, here's our exposure to two years. Um, on the flip side of that, most of our products would be suitable for high net worth individuals or RIAs who are increasingly concerned about exactly what I was referring to before, the homogenization of the industry, the fact that everybody is kind of locked into a 60-40 portfolio that looks basically like a target date fund. So products like our managed futures product, products like our newly issued commodities product, products like our short volatility strategies that offer a hedged exposure to short volatility so you don't have a blow up like the XIV, those are all products that are suitable for use by all of the above, but are particularly targeted at that high net worth or that individual investor who's actively interested in managing a slightly different exposure in their portfolio, or the RIAs who work for them and are good doing that within a model construct. Can you talk a little bit, I know you've spoken a lot at length about how like, especially with this 
Super 7 in 2023 leading the markets and FOMO by active managers trying to catch back up. Um, I've actually listened to a couple of your uh, yeah. talks on flows and, and, and how that's actually directing and moving the markets. And I thought it was really interesting to see uh, that, that the turn off and back on from everything surrounding the debt uh, ceiling limits um, and any thoughts you have on that, like forward looking. Yeah, so um, so let's split that into two separate components. So one is in general, anytime you have active managers, they are by definition going to go and try and find things that they can add value within the portfolio, right? As an active manager, I was I was actually originally a small cap specialist. And it was perceived that one of the ways that you could add value as an active manager is to go out and identify individual securities that you thought met the characteristics that were likely to lead to outperformance, right? Now that's been a disastrous strategy for going on seven years, but by and large, active managers continue to try to find and do what we're supposed to actually do, which is find interesting places to allocate our capital, right? the broad index flows are doing something totally different. They're simply trying to allocate capital on the basis of market capitalization or close to market capitalization. And that money is, um, I hate to use the phrase dumb money, but it really is literally just say, hey, we don't know. We're just going to follow what everybody else does in aggregate, right? So when I talk about flows, I try to distinguish between those two. I try to distinguish between the active flows and I try to and the passive flows, the systematic allocation to things like target date funds, et cetera. The reason why those two are very, very different is if you put your money into something like the Vanguard Total Market Index, and I can talk about competitor products, right, Brian? Nod if I can, shake your head if I can. Um, this is kind of uh, it's kind of flipping. Okay, so people who might be competitors. Um, their funds are trying to allocate on this basis of market capitalization. Now, the reason that that's presumed to have no impact on the market is, well, you're just buying everything in proportion to what everybody else is buying, right? That sounds like a great idea, doing the same thing everybody else is doing. But ironically, that's actually not the way the market works because liquidity in the market, the ability to buy and sell something actually doesn't scale with market capitalization. It scales with volume and volatility something that has a high degree of volume to trade, it trades an awful lot or a tremendous amount on any given day is gonna be more liquid. Something that has relatively low volatility is going to behave better for a market maker than something that has extremely high volatility. And as a result, they're not gonna demand a premium to trade that. And so if you actually look at how volume impacts securities or flows impact securities, it's not a function of market cap, it's a function of volume and volatility. And just to put like a very meaningful metric around that, the largest stock in the S&P 500 is Apple, right? $2.7 trillion in market capitalization. I think the smallest stock in the S&P 500 currently is Las Vegas Sands, which I think is somewhere around $11 billion. I don't have the numbers directly in front of me, so let's just pretend we're going with it, right? Now, what that actually means is that that Apple is 250 times larger in market capitalization than Las Vegas Sands. But the actual liquidity in Apple is maybe 15 to 20 times that of Las Vegas Sands. So when you're putting money in proportion to market capitalization, ironically, you're actually affecting Apple more than you are Las Vegas Sands if you're putting it into the S&P 500. On the flip side of that, if I give the money to Michael, and Michael's actively managing his portfolio. And he's like, man, this Las Vegas Sands thing is the greatest thing since sliced bread. He's going to put money into Las Vegas Sands disproportionately to Apple. And so when we see these two different types of flows, it basically can be characterized as small cap versus large cap or small cap versus super mega cap outperformance. And if you looked at the first half of this year, basically the entire um, active manager community was looking at the market and like, man, I don't really feel very good about this. This is pretty, I'm, I'm pretty nervous. I don't really see the economy as being nearly as strong as everybody thinks. I'm going to be more cautious in my allocation. By the way, can you, would you realize we're getting like four plus percent out of bonds now? What a fantastic opportunity that is. And so they actually neglected the small caps and the, the smaller companies within the indices, which is where they place their emphasis and that's exactly the behavior we saw. We saw the you know Fantastic Seven, the Magnificent Seven take off. And then everyone is suddenly sitting there having their clients call them up and be like, hey, why are you trailing the S&P so much? And they're like, 
uh, you know, I'm really nervous about stuff, right? Uh, debt ceiling, right? And the minute the debt ceiling turned into a non-event, people basically just said, oh, to hell with it, right? I can't stay out of this any longer. And you actually saw small caps take off, right? I mean, ironically, the stocks that should that ha that have the least sensitivity to the kind of broader nonsense of is the U.S. government going to pay its bills or not are the ones that were the biggest direct beneficiary. Why? Because suddenly the active managers no longer had an excuse. The RAs no longer had an excuse, and it's like, all right, I got to get on board. And so, you know, that when, when David talks about the flow dynamics, I try to very, you know, I try to emphasize for people like you got to split the two flows. You have to think about what is the mechanical money that is just going in on a dollar cost averaging basis every two weeks with your paycheck going into a target date fund that allocates on the basis of how old you are and when you plan to retire. Right. And then there's another group of investors who are actually trying to do what markets are supposed to do which is price the marginal cost of capital for individual securities and say, gosh, I really like what this company is doing. I'm going to allocate capital to them, marginally lowering their cost of capital, making it easier for them to actually obtain financing and to prosecute their objectives, right? Prosecute, not in the Louis, you know, uh, Rudy Giuliani sense, but you know, actually try to make it go forward, right? That's what capital markets are about. They're about pricing real assets and providing that marginal, that measure of the marginal cost of financing. And the really weird thing that's happened in our lifetimes is they've moved from an emphasis on that to, well, I should expect X percent out of the market to pay for my retirement, right? And, and that has irrevocably changed the way the world works. I mean, if all the money is basically coming in and saying, you know, equities return eight and a half percent a year on a very long term, and I'm going to put stuff in, in in proportion to the market because that's the best way to guarantee that return. Well, what I actually end up doing is skewing the cost of capital further and further and further in favor of those mega caps. And that's the world we live in. But as you alluded to, like with the active managers, there's the rotation within their portfolio where they might start chasing some names. And then there's like the flow in the category that gives them fresh dollars to allocate. And so one of the things that I've been like keeping my eye on is just the lack of flows in the thematic sector and the active space across everything. So like all the thematics basically withheld their share counts on the drawdown last year of equities. Uh, and now in the run up, they're starting to have sales. So like how does that affect your prediction on how these flows will move markets going forward versus the, is it just more super seven because that's the one who's going to go into the index uh, passive side, or how do you kind of equate the relationship between those two? Yeah. So I, so I actually wrote a Substack piece about this and you can go to my Twitter profile and find my Substack, or maybe you guys will post it. But, um, if you actually, it was called, um, uh, signs of artificial intelligence at work. And it actually looked at each of the individual ETFs and the potential impact that they have. And when you look at the craziness of some of the allocation that was happening earlier this year into things like technology funds, for a company like, let's just pick NVIDIA, for example, right? A company like NVIDIA, which is actively buying back its shares at the same time that ironically it's issuing shares, which strikes me as somewhat bizarre, but what the heck, right? Um, so you have a situation in which they are actively buying back shares and then selectively issuing shares. And then money is flowing into funds where they're not even trying to allocate it in proportion to their market capitalization. They're trying to allocate it in proportion to their market capitalization within a sector. And so that becomes this supercharged type dynamic. When I did the analysis on NVIDIA, it looked like, and just to, I'm going to toss out numbers here and I'll, I'll retreat and walk through the theory behind it, but like a dollar going into something like the technology index or into the artificial intelligence is going to take over the world index, right? That can have a hundred X multiplier on the price behavior of something like NVIDIA. I mean, if you looked at the actual flows that were associated with that 30 plus percent jump in NVIDIA after the, the earnings, if you remember the, 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 um, you know, what people tried to say, was like, Oh, it was all short covering. There isn't enough short covering in the world to cause a half trillion dollar stock to behave that way, right? What actually did happen in that scenario is, is that you had relatively small sums of money that was coming in 
new, trying to compete with shorts, trying to compete with the company itself, trying to compete with option market makers who were trying to delta hedge their exposure, which blew up in their face, right? All of those things ultimately created conditions under which what looked like about $7 billion going into NVIDIA caused the price to rise $500 billion. Like, and this is crazy when you think about it. Dan, I apologize. I just want to ask, is that because of the small tranches and the multiple small tranches versus it all, all going through a big passive player on the top of the uh, league table? Or is it execution? Yeah, so, so you, or... you, you, yeah. so, so you, you, you hit on a bunch of the components, but that all of those things play into it, right? And so one of the things that we've seen with NVIDIA that's crazy, I mean, I have to confess, I've never seen anything like this, is that NVIDIA on my models has actually been under distribution for about the past 10 months, meaning there's net selling occurring at the ask as compared to the bid, right? That's not supposed to happen when a stock goes crazy like this, but what appears to be happening is an order mismatch where the large orders are actually being executed as if they're under distribution, and then small orders are showing up and basically like, we have to have NVIDIA, right? So we'll bid it up, you know, a buck fifty, and nobody seems to care. So it's, you know, I'm seeing all sorts of really, I, I use the word crazy too much, but really crazy price behavior and volume behavior that suggests to me that the market is basically bifurcated between, you know, the giants who are saying, including Nvidia. Again, remember they're selling on a continuous basis because they're issuing shares to their employees. Right. And that's before they begin issuing $10 billion slugs in, in, you know, special placements to raise money for a company that ostensibly is printing money. Right. So, you, you know, you, you, you just have these really crazy phenomenon that I haven't seen in the mega caps this way ever before. Uh, you, you threw a lot at us. Um, and you that made it objective. real. I wanted anyway. to confuse you so you didn't ask me any more questions. No, no. And you made it real. So everybody Thanks. can take a, take a drink. Talk to us. You, you mentioned volatility, right? And volatility just looks like it's spiking up now. If you look at the VIX or you look at the move index and both you, you've got expertise on. Uh, I, I personally would prefer your take on the move index more than the VIX, but do both if you would. Sure. So um, I, I'm always cautious in saying I have expertise on the move because the creator of the move is my business partner, Harley Bassman. Um, so I'm always a little scared anytime I start talking about the move because it's definitely one of those things that I can screw up. Um, they are roughly analogous, right? So the VIX measures the implied volatility for a 30-day option on the S&P 500. Um, and it tries to capture the implied volatility across the strip of all available options at that expiry, right? So that means it's capturing extreme tails, et cetera. The move is a little bit different. It's actually the at the money volatility for um, five separate maturities, the two year, five year, 10 year, 30 year. And I think it's actually, I think actually, I guess it's four. Oh, it's double weighted the two, the 10, that's why. Um, but it's the at the money volatility for each of those individual futures contracts, the options on those future contracts. Um, what is being captured in the move is basically uncertainty about the direction of interest rates. What's being captured in the VIX is uncertainty plus a little extra, right? That basically captures how systemic is the risk, right? What's called the skew um, or the distortion that's created by the fact that people bid up the tails in options generally. So they're not directly analogous, but they are both very, very useful, right? Um, I would argue what's happening in the move index is, again, I agree with you, Dan, that it's probably more interesting than what's happening in the equity indices, the VIX. Um, what's happening in the move index is basically people don't know what the heck is going to happen right now, because under any rational framework, interest rates are absurdly high, particularly at the front end of the curve. Under some of imagined world in which we are supposed to go back to the interest rates of Paul Volcker, they feel very low against the levels that Ben Bernanke potentially drove them to or theoretically drove them to. They seem very high. And a lot of people are kind of pointing out, well, they're kind of, you know, what was historically considered normal. Um, 
the unfortunate reality is normal is always a function of how people finance themselves over the prevailing period. And we were talking a little bit about this beforehand, like the entire world has refinanced itself at very low interest rates. And now it becomes an interesting game of, you know, musical chairs of, well, who can hold on to that financing, right? And so ironically, we're seeing some really strange behavior. We're seeing things like commercial real estate being reevaluated on a combination of pandemic factors and much higher interest rates. And I, I think I shared with you guys uh, before when we were talking about this, you know, a piece came across my desk today that was highlighting the fact that a Chicago downtown office property was just reappraised down 74% from where it was in 2018, right? I mean, like that's a mind blowing number in the real estate world. Cause that means not only is the equity wiped out, it means the debt is wiped out. I mean, and like that's a that, that's a level of loss in secured paper you're not supposed to take, right? Um, not dissimilar, by the way, to what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, where they bought high quality mortgages and and paper that the Fed was guaranteeing, you know, buying, and saw it lose between fifteen and fifty percent, right? So, you know, that we're seeing things happen that are you know, the word unprecedented gets overused, but this is actually unprecedented. We've just never, I mean, we've never seen scenarios like this. Um, and so everyone is kind of sitting here now, you know, we saw the 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 move index move to all-time highs as the Fed was very actively hiking rates 50%, 50 basis points at a clip. It backed off a little bit as people, as we paused, et cetera. And now it's starting to rise again as people are like, what are they going to do? We don't know. We genuinely don't know. Um, Ironically, I think that's actually influencing the behavior that we're seeing at the long end, because as we're seeing prices volatility rise, it makes it harder for people to hold that paper, right? And so if you bought 30-year paper thinking that it was going to be a 11 or 10 vol sort of asset, and it's suddenly realizing 22, well, you got to kind of cut your holdings in half if you're actually sticking to your VAR limits. Right. And so that's causing yields to rise even further in what's called a bear steepening in the curve. Now, I personally think that this is like the very end of this process. But I've been wrong. I mean, I can't, I can't say it any more clearly than that. I've been wrong about this dynamic. And so now I'm kind of watching in bizarre fascination of like, how far could this actually get pushed? We've already, I mean, for those of you who are paying attention to analogies, the increase in the real interest rate, right, which is, you know, kind of the metric that you actually care about when we talk about like how expensive is financing, at least theoretically, you're supposed to be focused on the real rate as compared to oh. the nominal rate, because you should theoretically be compensated for the inflation component of it. Um, real rates at the 30 year point, right? So this is the next 30 years of real rates have gone from minus 0.5 to plus 210 today, right? Over the space of like 15 months, right? Now, I don't actually think that that's real. I don't think that that's a, an actual reappraisal of the underlying growth potential or the opportunities in the economy. But I do think it actually speaks to the extreme nature of what's happened. Like, just to put that in context, that means equity should be down 65%, all else being equal, right? Which, by the way, is exactly what we just saw in this commercial real estate. Dan's uh, shaking his head on that. All you're doing, all I'm doing there is maintaining constant growth and keeping a constant uh, equity risk premium, right? So what we've heard from people over and over again is the equity risk premium is is collapsing. That's a really like, you know, that's a the, what I described is if those things stayed constant. Ironically, actually, the equity risk premium should be rising because as we raise interest rates, and this is the other really weird thing that's happening, we're creating conditions under which the equities themselves, increasingly, this goes back to the commercial real estate example we just gave, what claim do those equities actually have on the underlying real assets and capital structure if suddenly they're forced to refinance at dramatically higher interest rates? Because suddenly the cash flows deteriorate, right? Suddenly your ability to collateralize and secure those loans deteriorates. And so the equity claim theoretically becomes more uncertain, and you should see a dramatic expansion in the equity risk premium, which just hasn't happened yet. And again, I'm going to put that at the foot of you know those large passive funds for the very simple reason that 
they don't care, right? Nowhere in a target date fund does it say, hey, guess what? The real interest rate went from negative 50 basis points to, two ten, to 210 basis points. We should probably think about allocating more money to 30-year real rates versus equities. That's not the way they work. They ask a single question. How old are you? That's it. That's all they do, right? And they choose an allocation metric that was set by some historical average on that. And that's where all the money is, guys. Like, I mean, I, I, I joke with our team at, at Simplify, like, you know, target date funds have gone from non-existent. They actually didn't exist in 2003. Today, they're a $4 trillion asset class. 2012, they were like 800 billion. I mean, that sort of growth is just mind blowing. One thing we've written about in our commentaries is like, it's not really like the maximum level of inflation or maximum level of short-term rates that matter, but it's like the duration of the extended period. Because as you said, of the carousel of like, who can hold off having to refi essentially, like most of us feel it as mortgage owners, a little bit of like prisoners in, in their own home. Um, one other thing that I've heard you mention that I thought was interesting was in the concentration of the top 10 was the drop in implied correlation on the S&P. Can you explain yeah. what that is and why you think that might be and what's a way to like play that in today's market? Well, if we were doing this over Zoom instead of at a bar in Chicago, I could actually show you some examples of that. But um, the, the easiest way to think about correlation or implied correlation um, is everybody kind of understands it like the riskiness of Coca-Cola or the riskiness of Apple is ultimately what it is, right? And then your portfolio through the benefits of diversification becomes less risky when you add uncorrelated assets, right? So if I own a suntan lotion company and an umbrella company, theoretically, I'm going to make money all the time, right? Because when it's raining, I'm getting paid. When it's sunny, I'm getting paid. The world is a perfect place. Um, if you think about the dynamics of the S&P, when it was not a particularly concentrated index, when the largest names represented less of the index, when the technology sector was 15%, not 35% of the index, the index is less correlated. It should actually be less risky, right? Now, part of the irony is, is that despite the fact that the index has become much more concentrated, that we have these giant positions and in individual names, and that the index's behavior is largely determined by companies that are actually, interestingly enough, direct competitors and also compatriots in a lot of this stuff, right? Is, is uh, Apple a competitor to an NVIDIA or is Apple a, you know, complement to NVIDIA because they use graphics cards, right? Really hard to distinguish these things. Um, but we've actually gotten to a point where the individual securities volatility has not retreated nearly as much as what we've seen in the index. And so the implications of that are that the level of volatility or the level of correlation that the market has to be pricing, what's called the implied correlation, has totally fallen off a cliff. And where it's completely fallen off a cliff is actually in the price that people will pay for the deep out of the money puts that represents the risk that like something really systemic happens, like a COVID, for example, right? The market is basically saying, yeah, not going to happen. Which was the asset class that- and By the way, to the market's year. credit, yeah. I mean, to the market's credit, it's been right, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that falling has not- Now, the other thing that I point out to people in the stuff that I write is that also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because if I'm willing to offer insurance, and I use the example all the time of, you know, um, real estate in flood property, in, in flood zones, right? If I'm willing to offer cheap insurance for real estate construction in flood zones, guess what we're going to get? A lot of real estate construction in flood zones, right? I, I would argue that that's actually what we're seeing. We're at the point where, you know, it has been rewarded for people to offer that insurance. They've recognized the value associated with that. And now, you know, what I would describe to people is like the, you know, the barn is filled with hay and TNT and there's all sorts of danger out there, but there's not a match yet, or at least there's not a match yet that is ready to cause the thing to blow or has caused the thing to blow, at least in real time. So I've got a, a 
I'm going to try and narrow my questions down if I can, because I think we're all going to agree here on the call. Uh, 60 40 model has its challenges. But um, when you look at the, the asset classes today, there's fixed income, there's equities, there's real estate as a separate class, or do they fall into the alternatives bucket? And frankly, is Apple a bond or an equity in your mind? Because it's a little bit of both to some. And then I got, I, I'm sorry, I got a, 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 another question if I can. Okay, so so let me hit that one first. Apple is an equity. Um, you can convert it into a fixed income like asset by selling calls against it. And that's one of the things I've tried to emphasize for people is I know know that debt or leverage is a dirty word, but the irony of where we are as a society is people are, and, and this has been true, by the way, for almost 20 years, people are desperate for fixed income. They're desperate for fixed income. And so if you're buying Apple and you're selling call options on Apple, what you've actually tried to do is convert Apple into the equivalent of a high yield bond. You're saying, I'll take all the downside risk but in exchange, I'm going to earn a premium in excess of the dividend or anything else, right? That's what you're actually doing. You've sold the upside, or at least a portion of the upside, and you have said, but I'll contra contractually take all the downside risk, right? And we see this over and over and over again. Again, this is part of the reason we see the behavior that we have in the market. Same thing happening with the S&P itself call overwriting strategies, very, very popular because they offer a combination of income and capital appreciation. You're trying to turn your exposure in equities into a bond because what you're saying is there's a shortage of fixed income instruments, right? There's a shortage of really attractive structured products that offer the diversified cash flow characteristics of the S&P 500 that I can, you know, take some downside risk in, but I don't see it as all that substantial. Yeah, there's, so there's the options writing or the writing for option for income purposes, but then there's also just the hedge on individuals, holdings of company stocks that have appreciated a lot too. So I've, I've definitely spoken to some practitioners that try to balance that too and avoid the call writing on the overappreciated shares so they're not going alongside the employees. Um, can you talk a little bit about variance in economic revisions? So I think that's really fascinating in today's markets. Um, okay, so so uh, variance is effectively the sum. <laughs> God, I'm trying to think about how to make this uh, acceptable in an audience. Um, we already talked about the VIX. Remember, I talked about that full suite of options, right? What you're actually doing there is replicating a variance contract, um, which is just in, in purely mathematical terms, variance is actually just the square root of volatility. Um, but you actually are, are turning around and creating a um, uncapped exposure that can explode in its valuation, right? Um, there are actually variance contracts. They're quoted in vault points, everything else. But the, the biggest component of variance effectively is just the extreme tail dynamics that play through. The second thing um, that you ask is... So, for anyone listening to this call, like I'm just gonna tell you straight up, like you don't need to know the difference between variance and vol. It's actually kind of irrelevant. Um, if somebody comes to you and says, we engage in an uncapped variance selling program, just like take your drink and walk to another table, all right? Um, it's just the easiest way to deal with the uncertainty around that dynamic. Okay, and then the, the second question that you asked, I'm sorry, David, was on- Just uh, in, in uh, well, I'll put it a little more simply, just like cha change in revisions in economic data uh, and like data, lack yeah. of clarity right. in historical economic data, especially post COVID and such, just because I think we're like all riding high on a couple data points on the overall uh, macroeconomic uh, well, so, so right, right now. But. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's a perfect example of this, um, which is Atlanta Fed GDP now, which many people will have seen is printing close to like, I think as of today, it was like 5.8% for Q3, right? Now that's Atlanta Fed GDP now is a mathematical program that is run, it's just an algorithm 
that is run by the Atlanta Fed that interprets incoming financial data or economic data and tries to predict the level of GDP off of those constantly introduced pieces of information. And so it's reacting to two separate components. One is the level and the second is the degree of surprise. And so it, it actually starts as kind of its base when it, it every time the Atlanta Fed starts off, it's actually picking a number that it thinks is pretty close to the average of what all um, forecasters are picking. And then it's saying based off of that and the surprises that come in, we're going to revise those numbers, right? This is where revisions get really, really interesting. Because if I look at something like what we saw today with unemployment claims, right? Initial unemployment claims were lower than expected, um, but they weren't that much lower. They were just lower a lot versus yeah. the revised up numbers last month, right? And so if you actually looked at the data set, it says, oh, unemployment claims were down a lot. Well, the Atlanta Fed GDP now is an algorithm says, oh, if they're down a lot, then that's obviously good for GDP. So we're going to raise them. But there was actually almost no discernible, certainly no statistical difference between the 239 print and the 240 estimate, right? That shouldn't have caused that type of revision, except perversely, it's looking at the rate of change for that individual data set. Now, that also introduces a second component, which is well, guess what? All of these employment beats that we're seeing, for example, where the non-farm payrolls are coming in higher than expected until the last one, they came in much lower than expected. And we've seen the data out there that shows like, you know, economists have gotten it wrong 15 times in a row. Job growth has been better than expected 15 times in a row, right? Well, ironically, if I look at those 15 times in a row, nine out of those times, we've actually had to revise down those numbers in the next month but that doesn't, nobody cares. Nobody builds an algorithm that says, hey, um, I'm really interested in trading off of the stale data and how that changes, right? So when you introduce an algorithm like the Atlanta Fed GDP now, it's a great illustration of how seemingly, you know, minor changes to those revisions can actually cause extraordinary moves. I guarantee you, we're not running 5.8% real GDP this quarter. We may be running three. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know how it's going to ultimately develop, but we are looking at a situation where the data is leading us astray on that. And the the real reason I focus on the revisions is because we're so focused on the employment dynamic. That's really the area that we point to and we're like, hey, the economy remains strong, people are employed, the unemployment rate is really low, et cetera. Um, the way we report our non-farm payroll gains, there's something called a birth death model. And this was introduced in 2000. It was revised in 2012. It's an attempt from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the Census to try to estimate the number of new businesses that are being created and businesses that are going out of business that are not actually responding to the surveys, right? It makes perfect sense. You launch a new business, you are not going to respond and say, hey, I hired three people when you know they don't even know to survey you, right? They don't have any real way to do it. Um, the problem is, is that birth death model is just hopelessly screwed up by all the shenanigans around things like the employee retention credits and the startup business recovery credits, um, the changes in 1099 reporting characteristics that have led pe many people are familiar with the Venmo headlines of, you know, now you need to report your Venmo numbers. It used to be that you didn't have to report a, a 1099 if you made up to $20,000 as an independent business. In 2022, that changed to $600. Well, guess what? Business formations exploded on metrics that you know um, require that that you know look at people required to file 1099s because we changed the rules. But that's not being captured in things like the birth death. And and this is the other thing that I think is really really important for people to understand. Like we don't know what is going on. The data is so messed up because we introduced this literally unprecedented event that the only close parallel is like a world war, right? We shut the entire world down and then we restarted it. And we are supposed to look at the data sets. We're like, oh, look, you know, unemployment's down from a, an unprecedented move, or um, we should adjust seasonality to reflect the fact that, you know, businesses that were closed because people had to mask up 
and you know weren't allowed within six feet of each other are suddenly actually allowed to open again right like how, how do you adjust for that we we have no idea right i mean we've almost gone back to the stone ages and then the 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 other reason why this becomes so and fun is a, is an air quotes unfortunately but it is actually a fascinating time in history as an economist you want to experience extreme events because what you actually see in those extreme events is, is newly revealed human behaviors, right? What happens when we give the average American household something like $20,000? How do they change their behaviors? Well, guess what? We had no idea in February 2020, but we got a pretty good idea now, right? And so that's actually a really interesting experiment that we all participated in. It sucked in, in the most you know real sense of the phrase, but we actually got to experience things that have now given us deeper understanding of stuff. And there's some of the most fascinating academic research and economics research in history is actually being written as we speak. Like the stuff that is coming out of some of the, the regional Fed um, research arms is unbelievably interesting. The great irony is, is that because they actually came out and told us that inflation was transitory, which, by the way, it certainly appears to have been, they were discredited in the political sphere to the point that Jerome Powell in the June press conference said, I think it's precious that the research staff has their own you know, forecasts, but they don't have to have any resemblance to ours on the board, right? We've got 4,000 PhDs, but, but yeah, isn't that interesting that they have a totally different perspective on interest rate hikes than we have? Isn't that cute? But you have to like reconsider the the other Fed chairman's uh, thoughts when basically it seems like everyone in that whole world is trying to be a politician right now. Absolutely, right? it feels like there's like a totally different. They're no longer giving you their expectations; they're giving you their political beliefs. Sorry, why Scott? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, um, I, I do want to open it up to questions after I ask mine. Um, you know, what's your take on bankruptcies? Because it's obviously going to be a focus now and something as a leading indicator of the future. And it seems like it's picking up. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna break the I'm gonna break the fifth wall here. Um give me two seconds. I actually have this up on my screen right now. Um so this is, um, oh, can you uh, allow me to share a screen? Mike, you, it's, it's you, right? Uh, see, I knew Venuto was angry at me this whole time. Oh, he loves you, man. You're muted, Mike. Finally, you're muted. No, no, it, it, you just hit share screen. It should work just fine. Now it says host, disabled. host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah. Okay. okay. You know what? You know what I'm going to do? We're going to turn this interactive, and I'm try going it now. to just all right. Just try okay. it now. There we go. All right. So um, this is actually looking at, at a, a credit model that I've used since the global financial crisis, before the global financial crisis. Um, just to orient people here, the red is high yield credit spreads. The blue is my, I'm sorry, the black is my credit target model. The pale, the faint blue lines that you see here, these are actually realized bankruptcies. And the darker blue here is just the 13 period moving average. Basically, a, uh, this is a weekly model. So it's looking at a quarter's worth of trailing bankruptcies. Going into the global financial crisis, I saw an unprecedented divergence between this. Uh, just to orient people here very quickly, this spike in high yield credit spreads that happened in 2002, this was Enron and WorldCom blowing up. And so that was actually a, a um, idiosyncratic event that hit the credit markets, but didn't hit the broader, um, the pricing in credit markets, but didn't actually hit the broader economy in the same way, right? So it was a very isolated event. I actually think there's a couple of these that are out there. Um, but going into the global financial crisis, I saw this weird divergence that started to build in 2005 where bankruptcies were rising, my credit spreads were widening, and yet high yield credit spreads, investment grade credit spreads, CMBS spreads, et cetera, were all showing no real signs of stress. 
Um, you may remember this part from the Steve, you know, the the um, the movie, The Big Short, where he's like, you know, okay, you're changing your positions. I get it. That's fine. Um, that was then. This is now, right? Bankruptcies are running ahead of that pace. This is actual bankruptcies, $50 million in assets and above. It's running ahead of that pace. My credit spread model says that we should be north of 800 on high yield credit spreads right now. Here's where we are, right? I mean, bankruptcies are exploding. Companies can't refinance. Commercial real estate can't refinance. Right. If you decide to sell your house because you want to move to Florida, yes, you might be fine in your local market. But if 10 other people decide to sell, there's not that many buyers out there. I mean, everybody talks about the housing market as like it's strong, but the reality is it's thin. Right. Think about it in public equity terms. And we saw prices making new all time highs on lower volume. What would we say? Oh, that's a warning sign. Right. But we look at the house and we're like, oh, it's really strong, fantastic. I, I, I just, I think this is the picture of our world right now. So can I ask, because one of the things a lot of people say is, okay, COVID's in the past, we're like done with COVID. We're going back to pre-COVID. And I always like to say like, you know, things weren't that great actually pre-COVID, like expectations are like pretty crappy going forward pre-COVID. And actually, if you look at that chart, it looks like there was a divergence in 2019. So, so absolutely did, correct. Yeah, I'll bring it back. Did COVID up. save us from a credit crisis in 2020. Um, and are you conspiracy theory that the government is trying to hide out? I'm joking about that. <laughs> but yeah. it seems like like COVID, and this is something that Mike and I talked about for a while, is that COVID actually kind of hid the fact that the wheels were falling off in 2019. Um, you know, David, you're. Um, I've talked about this for a little while. Um, you, uh, Daniel D. Martino Booth has started talking about this. There's a very, very cogent argument that basically says throw out everything that happened from February 2020 until basically November of 2021 and just pretend it didn't happen, right? Because the data was so messed up, the renormalization process was so crazy, the flows coming in from the government in terms of fiscal support, et cetera, the interest rate policies, et cetera. They all created conditions that basically took what looked like was becoming a very risk off event and turned it into a, an incredible but very short and very violent risk off event that then was completely reversed by um, the interventions. And so I, I think that's absolutely correct. I would actually argue that like the most rational way to think about what we're experiencing right now is, is that we've been in one giant expansion from 2009 until today that had begun to move towards a recession in 2018 when the yield curve inverted and things started to roll over and industrial production turned down. And then the massive amount of fiscal accommodation flipped it. I mean, I, I remember in, on, in April two, 2020, like I was actually super bullish back then. And I remember, you know, having interviews with people who'd be like, you know, this is it. This is the great liquidation. This is the this is the moment in which the wheels come totally off the bus. And I was like, I mean, you go back and I did an interview with Raul Paul, right, where his whole theme was like, you know, this is this is it. This is the great liquidation. And I'm like, I don't see that. There's so much money that is going to be spent by the government. There's so much support coming in that that becomes almost implausible. And it went far further than even I could have imagined, right? Far, far f further. Like things like PPP loans, um, did anyone ever really imagine that all of those were gonna be turned into equity? It's just a gift to business owners. Things like the employee retention credit, just a gift to business owners. You know, I'm give a lot of amounts of stimulus. What's up? So I was just going to say from our side, I was going to give, give a lot of credit to Mike Venuto because I've been with Title and Trosa for 10 years, and it's always been more from his side on the philosophical behavioral side. We were just like, there's no way the Fed's not stepping in. Um, yeah. and Mike and I were sitting there all weekend, like loading up our buys over and over, <laughs> over again all March yeah. long. Um, and that, that weekend, I bought like five Bitcoin, a boat, and then we came in Monday and we bought like Build America bonds at 15% discount in that. Like it was just just simple you just could not go wrong yeah um 
and, no, and, 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 and by the way, like, like, the, like I didn't want to deliver it because the price had gone up because the money came in already. So. Right. I mean, yeah. th things that I remember, like uh, you know, trades. Like if you if you remember, um, and, and within the ETF space, do you remember JNUG, right? Um, yeah. The the discount to NAV that that got to. So for those in the audience who aren't following this, JNUG was a triple levered um, gold miner ETF. Ironically, it was actually struck. It, its underlier was the actual ETF itself, and so in the ETF um, GD, uh, it, was it uh, GDX or GD? Yeah, I can't remember. But um, uh, began trading at a twenty-five percent discount to NAV. The triple levered version was trading at a seventy-five percent discount to NAV. Right? I mean, there was just so much chaos and so much nonsense, and it all got bailed out. And basically, the worst. Your 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 fundamental analysis was the better you did. I mean, it was just you know, because what you yeah. really saw was companies get massive amounts of equity injection, and that helps the most levered, unprofitable companies the most. Right? I mean, yeah, for us talking about zombie companies at that time, and you can see in your chart they didn't go bankrupt because they got you know, two hundred like hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of PPP. The right. owners cashed it out, and then they 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 closed the company instead of went bankrupt. Right, like it's it's just um, it's so illustrative in that uh, I'm like pointing it out of my screen, like you guys can see it. But uh, <laughs> the you know, the November twentieth, you can just see the bankruptcy is going down while the economy is shut down. Like it's it's yeah. so counterintuitive. Um, well, no, November twenty twenty. And November 2016 are actually great examples of that same FOMO uh, conversation that we had earlier, right? So if you think if you think about the election of Donald Trump, right? Remember what the headlines were. If Donald Trump gets elected, the markets are going to fall 15. percent If Hillary gets elected, the markets are going to fall 15 percent because she's going to hike taxes, right? Well, if under both scenarios the market's going to fall 15 percent, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to sell ahead of the event, right? Well, then once the event actually happens and the markets don't start falling 15%, what do you have to do? Now you have to buy back in. Well, guess what? It looks exactly like the debt ceiling, right? November, 2020, same thing. Oh my God, if Trump loses, we're going to get this communist Biden in and then it's going to be this terrible, guess what? Small caps massively outperformed. Why? The exact same behavior, right? And so like, Shame on me, by the way, for for not doing a better job of capturing some of this stuff because it is just so clear what's actually happening here. It's just that we're all being distorted by flows, and at the end of the day, that is really the current failing in the market, right? So the world that we were all raised in, the world in which we developed our investment theories, the world in which we learned how to think about companies and what markets are supposed to represent, was the world in which we were participants in the efficient market hypothesis. Right. By doing our little part, we were basically worker bees in a greater good that was creating a market that was largely efficient, even if we individually made mistakes. But that model, the model of the efficient market hypothesis actually requires some really interesting things. And this brings me back to the conversation about the giants. You know, the model of the efficient market hypothesis actually presumes that every participant in the market has equal endowment. Right. Now that, you know. Um, sounds like a terrible way to describe it in a world in which we have Harvard endowments that are much bigger, et cetera. But in this case, it's just another way of saying size doesn't matter because everybody has the same amount of money, right? That's the theory of the efficient market hypothesis. Dan's view and David's view and Cynthia's view and my view and Michael's view all carry equal weight in the market because we all have the same amount of capital to put to work. That bears no resemblance to the world that we inhabit today. Absolutely none. It was kind of true in a world that was dominated by the thundering herd in which all the individual Merrill brokers were able to call up their clients and be like, hey, I really think that you should buy Blue Star Airlines, right? But it bears absolutely no resemblance to the world that we inhabit today. So we have a world today in which it's just been truly, truly fundamentally changed and I hate to say this, but like we have to actually end that. We have to reverse this. I am very active in the political realm saying that we need to break up the triumvirate of BlackRock, um, uh, uh, Vanguard, and State Street 
not because I hate the individuals involved or because I think that they're inherently evil firms or that I personally stand to benefit from this, but like, man, if we don't actually change this, we do not have the market that we thought we did, right? We do not have a market about pricing capital. We have a market about responding to flows. And that's a totally different animal because those flows will eventually turn. We have a fundamental demographic imbalance with the baby boomers heading towards retirement. It's, it's it, we're, we're at the top of the hour. So look, there's a lot of questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to just because we had so much to cover. I'm sure Brian, if you want to pull them and, and make sure we get uh, people's answers and things like that so that we can reach out to them for you guys. Um, I really want to thank Mike Green for being here. I really want to thank Simplify for being part of the ETF revolution that we're all experiencing. I really, you know, I've been arguing for many, many years the, the passive world issues. I actually put a paper that David and I wrote back in 2013 in that we called the uh, business of indexation. And the idea that indexation had moved from uh, from being about benchmarking and, and research to being asset management. And when they did that, they also changed how indexes are done in a lot of ways. So to check the Substack, check um, uh, the, uh, the Simplify website. Um, I think we've moved from don't fight the Fed to don't fight the flows. <laughs> and it, it's really hard for us old dogs to to not embrace that. Um, so, uh, Cynthia, usually usually you get a word in, but we always give you the last word. So it's been, been a, a, a long day. So fire away. Uh, thanks. <laughs> That'll be the word for this week. Um, no, I just want to thank everybody for coming as always. I guess our drinking word was real. We got real today. We could have been crazy just as much. Um, so thank you so much, Mike. It was an a, amazing conversation and everybody for joining us and, uh, we will see you all next week. Thank you for having me. Real pleasure. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, thank Michael.